Good, good, good. Um, welcome this morning. If you came in after we sort of already started, welcome to Elam. Um, there is going to be a Sunday school. Oh, they're already heading up. Wonderful. Thank you, Becky. She's on it. Good, good, good. Um, before we move into um, a bit of time in the scriptures, I just wanted to take an opportunity and pray for Jade, who... Oh, you said, you didn't say Jake. <laughs> no. Do you need prayer? Uh, oh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Jade. Jade. Um, ah, who's back? You weren't, you weren't there a minute ago. No, I'm Oh, good. Um, so... You may not have noticed, you know, to the untrained eye, but um, Jade is due to give birth in six days. Is that right? Star Wars Day, May the 4th. Um, so very possibly the baby will come before we're here again next Sunday. Hopefully, yeah. So we just want to take a minute, pray for you. Um, we did agree you can stay down there. You don't need to walk all the way up here and... There's a baptismal tank here, and I'm not sure the the floorboards would take it at the minute because uh, it looks like he's going to be a big boy. No, All oh, right, okay. But um, is is Ronan in a bit? I've lost him as well. Oh, he's got Talia. Very good, very good. Not well. It's fine. It's fine if he's got Talia. But maybe, uh, we're just going to ask a couple of these, maybe Maxine, Melissa, Lauren, just, maybe just want to come around Jade, lay hands on her. Um, shall we stand, church? We're really just going to pray. I'll pray and we'll just allow some of, some of these people at the back just to lay hands on her. But it's such a vulnerable time giving birth. This is our second wee child um, in a relatively short amount of years but we are excited for them as a couple we're excited for talia who's going to be a big sister and we really just want to ask for god's blessing and protection over every aspect of this so if you speak in tongues feel free to reach out a hand and just speak in tongues or just say your own prayers over her but i'll lead father we thank you for jade and we thank you for ronan lord we thank you for these two lives that have been redeemed from, from a lost way of living, God, redeemed into your kingdom and into your purposes, far are saved for your glory and by your grace. And Lord, we thank you that already that grace has become generational in the life of little Talia, who is a blessing to so many. And Lord, this, this little baby in Jade's tummy, who is already blessing them, God, and they're eagerly excited for him to come and be with them now. Father, we just ask in the name of Jesus, your protection over the entire situation. Lord, we pray that his baby comes at your appointed time. No, we do pray that it is soon. We pray that it doesn't go on too long, that there's not too much discomfort in the waiting. But Father, we do pray for your, your grace and your timing to be over everything, Lord. We pray for you to be in all the details of, of just everything the staff who are on that day at the hospital, the bed that they get, the timing of it all, Lord. We pray for your presence to be manifested in all of it. Lord, we pray for Jade's physical health during the birth. We just pray, Lord, that you would go before her, shield her, fill her with your, your strength, fill her with your healing power. And we just pray for a safe and perfect delivery for this little baby. Lord, we pray that everything goes well we pray that the baby is in perfect health we pray that jade comes out in perfect health lord we just pray for a hedge of protection around the family and around the couple lord protect them from any anything the devil might try and throw against them in the next few days lord when they're when they're tired when they're exhausted when they're maybe not getting as much sleep lord we pray that you would guard their mind guard their hearts guard their family and their, their love for one another. Lord, in the name of Jesus, go before them. Be above them, be under them, be on every side of them and be within them. Lord, we just pray that they'll look back on these days and weeks and just see the evidence of your goodness and your grace upon their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
Thank you. Do keep us updated on stuff, and I think Lauren may have already been in touch about um, a bit of a meal rota for these guys. So um, if if this is the first you're hearing about that, but you'd be interested in helping, chat to Lauren afterwards. I'm sure there's probably space for a few more people and um, just to extend it by a few more days. Good, good, good. Um, please turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, and looking at verse 37. There's some Bibles in the back bookshelf there, so if you don't have one with you this morning, you feel free to borrow one of those and follow along if you don't have one on your phone or something like that. And as always, if you're here and you maybe don't own a Bible, but you're interested, you're very welcome to take one of those home with you, just as a little gift from us today. Let's just go straight into this. Mark 15, verse 37. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. And we'll stop there. Three verses. Today's reading focuses on the, the death of Jesus. That's the, that's the context of, of the chapter. That's the part of the story that it's in. But... What I want us to look at is the events of verse 39. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Have you ever noticed how, how random this verse is? It almost seems a little bit misplaced. You've maybe never noticed that. You've maybe never thought about it because, because as Christians living 2,000 years after the fact... We sort of expect it to be there. We kind of know the bigger story. But imagine for a minute, just imagine that, that you know nothing about the Bible. Imagine you know nothing about Israel, about Judaism, about Christianity. You, just, you know nothing about it. You have grew up on a desert island and all you have to go by is a Gospel of Mark that someone has put on your hand, put in your hand, and you're reading it for the first time. This is a completely new story to you. And you're, you're reading through this book, and you, you discover Jesus, and the healings, and the teachings, and, and the miracles. And, and then suddenly you get to about three quarters of the way through it, and he's arrested. And he's tortured, and he's condemned to die, and then he's crucified. And, and you, you're getting to the, to the most important part of the book. It's all building up to this. And suddenly you think to yourself, oh, man, the hero in my story is about to die. I didn't know this was going to be one of those stories. You know, I think we've all probably had that, maybe in a book or in a movie. You know, you know there's only a couple of pages left. The movie's got five minutes left. And suddenly... The hero's dying or in this impossible situation and you're like, ah, oh, maybe this is one of those stories where the good guy loses. Wasn't expecting this. I've no idea what's going to happen next or how he's going to get out of this. And then we get to this verse and Mark says to his, his gripped readers who are in shock with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. <sighs> what? And then Mark does the strangest thing. Just as we're all hanging on for the next words, reading ahead for the next sentence to find out what's going to happen, he suddenly switches scenes. He takes our attention away from the cross at the most important point of the cross and he adds this really random bit of information. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And you're, you're sitting reading it and you're like, what has that got to do with anything right now? And quick as a flash, 
he switches back to the cross and picks up the story of Jesus and the centurion. It's so bizarre. It's almost like he, he, he copy and pasted something and just forgot to delete that from the final from the final edit. It's just so random the way it's put in. It's like, have you ever been listening to a really good worship song on YouTube? And just when you get to the big emotional bit, it suddenly switches off and you get a five second ad for Foxy Bingo. And you're like, oh, what? I, it's kind of jarring. And this is kind of jarring. Right at the most dramatic part of his story. Which means either Mark is, is, is not a very good storyteller, or this thing about the curtain is actually really important. So important that he interrupts the, the summit of his gospel, the death of Jesus, to announce it. And because I think Mark actually knew what he was doing when he wrote his gospel, I'm going to suggest that actually this thing is there because it's very important. So let's just take a wee look and see what it's all about. Let me just pray. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the message that is in it, for the way that it has been brought together both by, by the, the writers of the scriptures and by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just pray that our hearts would be good soil this morning to receive your word and be guided and fed by you. Amen. Amen. If I were to ask you, where does God live? You may all give me some, some different answers. I think a couple of people would say God lives in heaven. And some people might say... God lives in the hearts of his followers. Some people might say, well, God lives everywhere. Because God is everywhere. If you ask a child, the child might say God lives in the church. That's our fault, really. We used to call churches the house of God, didn't we? It's a bit confusing. I remember a kid once asked a question. He said, does God ever get lonely in church? during the week, waiting on all the people to come back and visit him on a Sunday. He thought he lived there. thought, oh, that's God's house, that's where he lives. And we only go and see him once a week. Different ways you can think about it. But if you were to ask a Jewish person living 2,000 years ago or more this question, there's a very good chance that they would say to you, God lives there, in that temple. See that big temple in Jerusalem? That's where God is. And they would understand that God was also everywhere and that he was in heaven. But for a Jewish person, the temple, and, and more specifically the Holy of Holies, was where God's presence dwelt upon the earth. It was his throne room, if you will. While Israel was in good covenant with God, his presence dwelt above the mercy seat, which is the golden lid to the Ark of the Covenant, that, that box made famous in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it was kind of like his, his, his earthly throne. If the Holy of Holies is God's throne room, the Ark of the Covenant, the golden box inside of which the stone tablets were, which had the Ten Commandments carved into them, it was kind of like God's throne there was not a more sacred place on all the earth. And what was the entrance to this most sacred of throne rooms? Was it a golden door fit for a king? Was it an iron gate fit for a vault? No, it was a curtain of all things. We first learn about this curtain in Exodus 26 when God told the Hebrews to build a tabernacle in the wilderness. He said to them, make a curtain of blue and purple and scarlet yarn and finely twisted together linen with cherubim woven into it by a skilled worker and then hang it on golden hooks on four posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold standing on four silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasps 
and place the Ark of the Covenant behind the curtain. This curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place, the holy of holies. This is where this, this curtain that we're talking about is first introduced and it existed, as we read here, for one single purpose, to separate, to separate the holy of holies from everywhere else. The message of this curtain is clear. God is in here and you're out there. You can come a little bit close, but you can't come too close because God is holy and you're sinful. That's it. That's why this curtain existed. Fast forward a few hundred years and the Jews are no longer living in the wilderness, but they're in the promised land. Their little tabernacle that they had been told to build has been replaced by a big temple and the little delicate curtain that once hung on four little hooks has been replaced by something a little bit more imposing. The curtain that hung in the temple when Jesus was around was 60 foot wide. It was 30 foot high. It was as thick as the palm of a man's hand, according to the mission. Now just hold your, see how thick your palm is. Okay, that's not a curtain. That's a prison mattress. I've had steaks thinner than that. It was made up of 72 individual pieces sewn together. It required 300 priests to maneuver it. And they even discovered that horses couldn't tear apart the individual pieces that had been sewn together when they were tied to it. It was a monumental piece of fabric. It was a, a titan among textiles. And it hung there for years and years with one solitary purpose to declare no entry. This curtain symbolized the division between God and humanity, between heaven and earth. It, it was a physical manifestation of the uncrossable divide between his holiness and our sinfulness, a reminder of God's separation from us, of his distance towards us, of his, his remoteness. And that because of our, our continued constant state of fallenness, we can never have access to him. We can never get that close to him. We can never really be with him. And for 1,600 years, this was the situation. But then, at 3 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, just outside of Jerusalem, Mark tells us that with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And at that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The moment that Jesus Christ died, the curtain was torn in two. A piece of fabric so large that you could gift wrap a bus. So thick that horses couldn't pull the stitches apart was burst right down the middle. And in that moment, centuries of separation was ended. 1600 years of religion was overruled by the blood of Jesus. And the curtain that once divided us from God was now opened and directed us towards God. And in that moment, on a personal level, our curtain was torn in two. Our curtain of unworthiness. 
our curtain of, of religious requirement, our curtain of guilt and judgment and sinfulness before a holy God was torn apart. For the first time since the Garden of Eden, men and women were made acceptable before God, given access to God, all by the blood of Jesus. Amen. And I think this is cool. I think this is the coolest bit about it, but it, it was, it's as if it was torn apart by God himself. Because Mark just chucks in this little footnote, it was torn in two from top to bottom. Not bottom to top, not side to side, not diagonally, not into confetti, but top to bottom. As if the hands of God himself reached down, grabbed hold of it and just tore it asunder. God made the way. Because it was only God who could. God was the one who initiated the curtain. Only he had the right to get rid of it. And that's exactly what he did through the death of Jesus on the cross. When, Je when Jesus died on that cross, he, he took upon himself the sin of the world. He took upon himself the fallenness of the world, the, the unworthiness of the world. All, all of yours and all of mine. He took the responsibility for all of this upon himself. And when he died on the cross, so did it. He, he paid the price. He did the time. He, he went on death row so that you could get off death row. And then once, in, once all of that sin and guilt and fallenness, which, which Jesus lifted off our shoulders, once, once all of that was dealt with, there was now nothing standing between us and God. It was removed. It was forgiven. Humanity could once again be restored into its proper relationship with him. This is what the Bible's talking about when it says that when Jesus was on the cross, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. As Jesus Christ began to take hold of of our sin, of my sin, of your sin, as he began to take hold of that, God was beginning to take hold of us. God was in Christ. And when Jesus breathed his last, that work was completed forever. The spiritual barrier between us and God was broken. Therefore, the physical barrier that hung in the temple for everyone to see was torn also. Hallelujah. This is, this is what the death of Jesus means. This, this is, this is, it means the forgiveness of sins. It means access to God again. It means being born again to a life filled with his spirit. Saved from a life of spiritual emptiness. A born again life. A resurrected life. An eternal life. A life that each and every one of us was initially created to live, but never did. Because we were born into sin. And so before I go on, I just want to give, I just want to give the opportunity here for, for everybody, for, for anybody, to receive this life for themselves. If, if you're here today and, and, and you don't know Jesus, and you know that you don't really know God, you know of God, and you maybe kind of have a book, but you know I don't know him. Nothing's ever actually changed for me. This spiritual emptiness that I'm describing fits where you are. And I want you to know that it's exactly for this reason, this specific reason in your life that you're experiencing that Jesus came and he died. He paid the price for your sins, so that if you wish, you can ask God to forgive you. You can ask God to be reconciled to you. 
You can ask him to fill your life with his spirit that you have been living without for far too long already. This is why we get called born again Christians. Not because the body's born again, but because our spirits are. New life born inside of you. And so this morning I'm just going to give you an opportunity. I'm, I'm going to pray a prayer, a very short, simple prayer. And if this is for you, just, just make this prayer your own. I'll just ask everybody to close their eyes and maybe amen along with me. But if this is for you, just make this your own. This is you speaking to God right now. Lord God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for me, to make a way for me to be saved and reconciled to you. God, I confess to you in my heart that I am a sinner. And I confess to you that I do need your forgiveness and I need your mercy. And I'm asking you, in the name of of Jesus please forgive me please come into my life make yourself known to me on a personal and powerful level give me new life and fill me with your Holy Spirit forever Amen Amen. If you did pray that for the first time or even the second or third time, but you meant it a bit more this time, whatever. If you, if you want to talk, come and talk to me or anyone else that you know here who looks friendly. Not him. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. <laughs> Amen. It's good news, isn't it? It is good news. Do you want some bad news? <laughs> well, tough. <laughs> there is a wee bit that I just want to share at the end, which, which isn't, isn't as positive. We know that the curtain was torn around about 30, 31, 32 AD when Jesus died. We also know that temple worship and the ongoing practices of Jewish sacrifice continued until AD 70. And it only stopped in AD 70 because the Romans destroyed the temple. So for 40 years, it continued on. Which means that after the death of Jesus, and I, I suspect probably very soon after the death of Jesus, the curtain that was torn in two was stitched back up again. The curtain that was torn in two was stitched back up again. Somewhere along the line, the religious leaders tried to undo what God had did. Where God had made a way, they tried to sew it shut where God tore down religion, they built it up again. Where God had made their priestly roles redundant by replacing them with his own new high priest, Jesus Christ himself, they said, no, thank you, and reinstated themselves as the gatekeepers between God and people. kind of shocking, isn't it? Kind of sad. And the reason I'm saying this is because I think often we are guilty of doing exactly what those priests did. On a personal level, I think many of us find ourselves repairing our own curtain. What I mean is, the finished work of Jesus Christ has made you worthy 
in God's eyes. Yes? Yet how often do we get our sewing kit out and stitch up the curtain of unworthiness? The blood of Jesus has washed you innocent, yet how often do we dust off and rehang the curtain of guilt? How often do you repair the curtain of separation whenever you sin? How often do you repair the curtain of religious requirement when you think you can do it on your own and earn God's favour? How often do you live your life as though God has not already made himself 100% available to you as if he did not already die to bring you to him? What I'm saying is, if there's anything in your life right now that you, you know is becoming a barrier between you and God, making your relationship with him difficult, making you want to not face him or be in his presence, you need to understand that stuff is homemade. That's not coming from his end. God didn't just move heaven and earth for you. He moved from heaven to earth for you. In Christ, God literally died so that any veil, any obstacle, any prison door between you and him could be torn open. God tore your curtain. So who are you to try and stitch it back up again? Who are you to wallow in guilt and shame when the blood of Jesus himself was spilt to make you innocent? Who are you to doubt God's love for you or his forgiveness of you when the word of God has, has declared it for all time? Who are you to hide yourself from God when you don't feel good enough after Jesus died to make you good enough. I've already said it today, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, Jesus was, was clothed in our sinfulness. And when we received him into our life, we became clothed in his righteousness. So, so when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees his son's goodness, not your own. So the next time you, you feel unworthy, the next time you feel guilt-ridden, crippled with shame before God, just remember in those moments, it's not your righteousness that you're calling into question. It's his. Don't go feeling unworthy of God because you're not good enough. Or because you committed that sin again. Because you were never good enough. None of us were. No one ever has been. No one ever will be. And to assume that if only you had sinned a little bit less last week, that you would somehow be in a more spiritual place, a more holy place, a better standing before God, I'd be more acceptable before God if I didn't shout at her, if I didn't watch that, if I didn't do that. To, to, to believe that is probably one of the most arrogant and prideful lies that you can fool yourself into believing. You with me? Have you ever heard something like this in your head before? Um, I, I don't feel like having my quiet time now, not after losing my temper the way that I did earlier. I'm so embarrassed, I don't even want to speak to God about it. 
or I, I don't feel like standing and lifting my hands in worship, not after knowing what I did with them this week. We think these things, and like Adam and Eve, we try to hide ourselves from the God who's compassionately looking for us. And we wish we had done better, which is good. But we wish we had done better as if one or two sins less would have made us one ounce more acceptable before God. I hate to break it to you, but if you think like that, if you feel like that, that's pride. That's another sin. It's a catch-22. Trying to earn it, trying to buy it, trying to be good enough for it. Just adds to, it just makes it worse. Isaiah 64, 6 says that our good works are like filthy rags to him who is holy. That's why it had to be his righteousness. It had to be Jesus' righteousness. Because he was holy. It has to be his righteousness that we're clothed in. God made him who had no sin become sin. So that in him we become the righteousness of God. It's by the grace of God that you're invited in. And it's by the grace of God that you'll remain in. Your good works got you nowhere. It's the imputed righteousness of Christ that clothes you. That's what's brought you into the Pharaoh's presence. So, so don't do what Adam and Eve did and hide from God whenever you feel that you've sinned or you've made mistakes and, and you feel unworthy. Don't, don't sew up that curtain of separation and hide behind it just because you don't feel like you deserve to be at the other side of it. It's by the grace of God that we're called sons and daughters and it's by the grace of God that we remain so. Satan wants you to sin because he knows that when you do, you will automatically take that back step from Jesus. You'll automatically, you'll not want to pray to him. You'll not want to worship him. You'll not want to be close to him. You, you'll, not, you'll not want to, you know, I remember sometimes me and Lauren used to have like these arguments and I was maybe a little less sanctified back in the day and I would be ashamed of the way that I spoke to her and then it'd be bedtime and I kind of wouldn't want to go to bed. I didn't feel like I deserved to go in bed with her and feel, act like everything was okay because I felt like I had not been my best self. And, and, you know, I want to sleep in the couch because I don't feel like I deserve to be there because I've not treated her right. And that's, what, that's why Satan wants us to sin because, because when we do sin, we don't want to be with God. We want to give him the bed and we'll sleep in the couch because we don't deserve to be in there with him. But don't fall for it. You've got the word of God. Be smarter than the devil. The next time you sin, just repent. Say sorry and take a step towards Jesus. Use your sin. Use your mistakes. Use these times of guilt and contrition to drive you forward. Get in the habit of, see the next time you sin and the devil tempts you and he gets you and you're like, oh man, I can't believe I did that again. Just start speaking in tongues. Just start saying sorry. Just start saying, Father, please be with me now. Who knows, if, if you use every, every time you sin as an opportunity to move closer to God, maybe Satan will just stop tempting you as much. He tempted Jesus three times in the wilderness. Each time Jesus turned to the scriptures, and then it says the devil was like, you know what, sack this. I'm going to go away and come back maybe for a better time. I'll maybe come back when he's a bit weaker or a more opportune moment. Satan realized the more I tempt this guy, the more he goes into the Bible. Let your sorrow, let your contrition, let your guilt drive you towards Jesus, not away from him. When God tore that curtain, he tore it for a reason. And he tore it forever. Don't you go stitching it up again. Amen? Amen. Let's stand.
going to ask our music team to come up. We're just going to have a, a song of... We're just going to have a wee bit of ministry time then. Um, going to ask Richard and Jenny to come and just pass out the communion stuff. Band, do you just want to play a minute? We're not going straight into a song. We're not going straight into communion. We're just going to acknowledge... Please serve, yeah. But when the communion comes to you, just hang on to it and we'll all take it together. We're just going to take a minute or two with communion in our hands, with the music playing, just to acknowledge the Holy Spirit's presence here with us. The Spirit's been speaking to some of you this morning. Let's not just move on to the next section. If you want to close your eyes, close your eyes. If you want to raise your hands, open your palms before God. I just think that the Spirit of God has been speaking to some of you this morning. Some of you have got in the habit of sleeping in the couch when you fall out with Jesus. It's self-imposed. You don't feel good enough to be with him. So you back off. You close the curtain. You separate. You don't feel worthy of looking him in the eye. You don't feel worthy of praying. You don't feel worthy of ministering. You just don't feel good enough. But God tore the curtain because we were never going to be good enough to tear it ourselves. If you are in Jesus Christ, your sin has been forgiven and your spiritual bank account has been maxed out on His righteousness. It doesn't matter if it's your best behaved day or your worst behaved day you will never be more forgiven and you will never be more righteous even when you're living in the moral gutter your flesh has taken a hold of you if you are in Christ you are more forgiven and more righteous in that moment than you will ever be because it's of him it's not of you it's a push towards him raise your face in repentance and look for his face. Adam and Eve literally hid behind a bush because they were ashamed to have God look upon them. We don't need to be like them. We are not them. We're covered in the blood of Jesus. God's looking for you. He's calling you out of hiding. As we take these emblems, we remember price that was paid paid in spilt blood and broken flesh a great cost that was met by an even greater love this is what the writer of Hebrews says somewhere within those 40 years when the curtain was sewn up again by the priests the writer of Hebrews says this he says, every one of those priests stands daily at his service, 
offering over and over the same old sacrifices which can never take away sin. But when Christ offered for once and for all a single sacrifice, he then sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until all his enemies would be made a footstool under his feet. For by this single offering at the cross, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. For by that single offering at the cross, he has perfected for all time those of us here who are being sanctified. We might not be sanctified fully, but we are perfected. Let's share the communion together. The body of Christ that was broken for us. And the blood of Christ poured out for the forgiveness of sins. If you want prayer this morning, feel free to come and find myself or move down the front or move down the back. We've got a few members of our prayer team in the room and just make yourself known and they'll, they'll find you. Or come and tap Richard and Jenny in the shoulder and or Sue, who's at the back. Somebody will pray with you. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. It was won for us by the death of Jesus. We thank you for the righteousness of Christ that has been credited to our spiritual bank accounts. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, being here with us now, seals in the hearts of each and every one of us who you are speaking to. May we never hide from you again. Let us know, God, that there is no sin so grave that it diminishes our standing before you because the righteousness of Christ and the blood of Christ overrules all other things. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, please sit down. That was good. You might not have noticed it, but Pete was making some noise at the back. I know he's hiding behind the lectern, but we heard you. I think... Yeah. I won't tell you how many years Pete's been waiting to get the drums back on stage. But... <laughs> God's Amen. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, there is an offering box at the back there for anyone who's come looking to give this morning. We are going to have some refreshments. So if you're new here, visiting, you're very, very welcome to hang about. In fact, please do get a couple of stick with us. Get to know somebody. Uh, Park Brew and the Park Brew Prayer Meeting will be on this Wednesday as usual. Uh, but just one other announcement. Some of you who have been here... Um, since before lockdown, we'll remember that we used to have something called Equip and Encounter Evenings, which was a, a monthly Sunday evening service. At the end of the month, last Sunday of the month, we would have an encounter service, which was really a Holy Spirit meeting. And we would make some space in here. The, the team, the band would lead us, and we would just have uh, 90 minutes, an hour or two, just seeking God, seeking his gifts, his power, his presence. Uh, we, we pull the blinds down, we put the spotlights on, we make it all trendy, like one of those cool churches. And it's really just about seeking God. It's about encounter. 
and there's no heavy teaching or anything like that. It's just coming and meeting with God. And then the alternative month, we would, we would have an equipping service where we would, we would have a service like we do here, but it is run by you people. Someone who hasn't preached before is going to come up and preach. Someone who's not led communion before is going to come up and, and do the communion. Someone who's never shared before is going to give a testimony. It's an equipping service. And, and I want as many of you to be as equipped and built up as possible. Um, because then that's more time off for me on a Sunday morning. And, um, and we, we, we've had that. We, you know, Mark and Becky's son, Joe, was here. Joe, one time he, he did a testimony, then he did communion, then he preached. And then after that, he done a, a free, free sermon series on a Sunday morning. We, we tried to equip him and prepare him and we gave him a shot. And Joe's a really good speaker. Um, and that, we want to raise up speakers and people at the front and and just do all of that stuff. So, um, the last Sunday in May, we are going to have our first encounter service. And it's going to follow on from then. I'll be in touch with people about the equipping service. We might do two encounters for one equipping. Just depends on how many volunteers we get. But um, that is starting back up again. So if you're about on a Sunday evening, um, look out for the, the updates and the notifications on that. Pray into it. It was a magic thing last time, meeting with God in a different way, in a, a more unrestricted way. And we're looking forward to doing it again. The only reason it stopped is because COVID happened. So it's probably due time we get back to it. All right. All right. God bless you. Have a good week.